Okay, he dismisses the young men. He says, I am the lad, we'll go yonder and we will worship, verse 5. Verse 6 says, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. This is very dramatic. He took in his hand the fire and the knife, the, fire to, the, the knife to slay his son, and the fire to burn the offering of his dead body. And the two of them walked on together. What a walk that must have been. And Isaac spoke to his father Abraham and said, Now, if you were in the John course, we talked about this in John 1, because there's a, a connection between this verse and John chapter 1. Isaac is not a little bitty child. He's 15 or 16. Isaac is not an unintelligent boy. He knows what's going to happen. And in verse 7, he asks a, a very relevant question. He says, Dad, you know, it looks like we've got almost everything we need for a sacrifice. We've got the fire and we've got the wood, but my father, where is the sacrificial animal? Where is the lamb? Now, when Isaac asks that question in verse 7, I'm, I'm supposed to read the verse, I'm told. Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, verse 8, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And then dramatically again, so the two of them walked on together. Abraham gives a beautiful answer. It's a wonderful answer. It's an answer which gives a new name to God, Yahweh Yira, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. It's an answer of faith because the answer indicates the discovery of a new excellence in God. Whereas the horror was that Abraham would have been tempted to believe that he had discovered uh, a new terror in God instead of a new excellence in God. Now, if you'll remember in Genesis 18, Abraham is involved in a dialogue which is virtually a prayer with one of the heavenly visitors who's walking towards Sodom and Gomorrah, who are walking towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham wants to know if those men are going to destroy the city if there are only 50 righteous in the city or if there are 45 righteous, or if there are 30, or if there are 20, or if there are 10. Now, what is Abraham really doing in that prayer and in that dialogue? He's trying to discover something about God. He's trying to intercede for Lot and his family. But in interceding for Lot and his family, he's also learning about God. That's what happens in prayer. We pray for somebody else, but while we pray for somebody else, we learn things about God. Prayer is an effort um, which has horizontal implications, those around us and beside us. But prayer is a vertical focus, and we receive vertically either, either the answers for the people who are around us or the things that God teaches us about Himself in prayer. Well, what is Abraham learning about God in prayer? Abraham is really asking this question in Genesis 18, am I more merciful than God? Do I care more about these poor people who are about to be burned up by this fire falling from the sky? Do I care more about those people than God cares about them? That's the question. The answer is no, you don't care more about them. Now, there's a different question which Abraham would have been tempted to struggle with as he contemplates this assignment that God has given him. And this is the question. Is God no more merciful than the Canaanite deities? Is God no more merciful than the gods of the Canaanites, the idols whom they worshipped, who required that they burn their children as an offering? The Canaanites offered their children in sacrifice to their gods. So this would have been a struggle for Abraham. 
a temptation for him to believe, is God no more merciful? Is my God, the God who spoke to me among the Chaldeans, and the God who brought me into this land, and the God who gave me a son through my aged wife, is that God no more merciful than the gods of the Canaanites? Is there anything distinctive about this God? And when I say the gods of the Canaanites, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 20, that when the Gentiles sacrifice, they do sacrifice to demons. So, of course, I'm not talking about real gods. I'm talking about demons. And Abraham must have struggled with this question. And we find the answer. We find the answer in chapter 22. Now, I tell you there was a connection between Isaac's question and the New Testament. And I also tell you that his father Abraham gives a beautiful answer, a wonderful answer, a, an answer which is an answer of faith, an answer which discovers a new excellence with God, but it's an incomplete answer. Isaac says, Father, here's the fire, here's the wood, but where is the lamb? Abraham gives a beautiful answer. The Lord will provide the lamb, my son. But it's not a complete answer. The complete answer is not found in Genesis 22. The complete answer is not found in the book of Genesis. The complete answer is not found in the first five books of Moses. The complete answer is not found in the 39 canonical books of the Old Testament. The answer comes through the mouth of the first preaching prophet of the New Testament. Just for a minute, hold your hand in Genesis 22 and turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Although John does not record it, by the end of John 1, Jesus has been baptized in the Jordan River in the wilderness of Judea by his older cousin, John the Baptist. He has gone into the wilderness and been tempted by the devil. That's also not recorded by John. It's recorded by Matthew. He returns to the scene of his baptism, and as he walks back into the neighborhood, as Jesus walks back into the neighborhood, John the Baptist sees him. John 1.29, ne the next day he, meaning John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming to him and he said, there he is. There is the answer to Isaac's question. There's the one Isaac asked about. That's what he wanted to know. That's what everything, that's what everyone in the Old Testament wanted to know. Where is the sacrifice acceptable to God? Father, where is the lamb? There he is, said John the Baptist. There is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. St. Augustine, who died in the siege of Carthage in 430 A.D., said it this way. God give, God requires what he gives. Who gave Isaac to Abraham? God did. God gives what he requires, and God requires what he gives. He gave Isaac to Abraham. He required Isaac from Abraham. Abraham. But God didn't let Isaac die. And God was not going to let I, Abraham kill his son. He was not. He was never, ever going to do that. He did want to prove Abraham's trust. He did want to prove Abraham's faith. Before you become a father, you can't appreciate the, or a mother, you can't appreciate 
the price that God the Father paid in the sacrifice of Christ. Before you become a father or a mother, you might be tempted to think, well, you know, that wasn't very uh, heroic of God to let his son die. Why didn't he die himself? That's a very childish question. That's a very childish perspective which reflects a real immaturity and a real misunderstanding of what a father or a mother feels. I would rather die a million times than have my son die once. A billion times. Every normal father or mother feels that way. And what does it mean that God was testing him? What does it mean that God was proving him? What if we were left with our final memory of Abraham as someone who, fearing for his own life, put his wife in a position of moral compromise, put his wife in a zone where she would certainly be raped or ravished by a man that she did not want to be married to? What if that's the only memory we had of him? But by chapter 22, his faith is so heroic that he immediately obeys God and trusts God in this terrible, terrible thing that God was apparently requiring of him. So they get to the place. Isaac lays down, says in verse 9, then they came to the place of which God had told them. You know, sometimes we come to the place where it appears that God is, is requiring a terrible, terrible sacrifice of us. Abraham built the altar, he arranged the wood, he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. Then he raises the knife. He raises the knife. And just at that moment, the angel of the Lord. Is this the Moloch Yahweh? Is this the pre-incarnate Christ? Well, perhaps it is. The angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not stretch out your hand against the land and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. It's Christ. From me. You, the angel speak. You haven't withheld your only son from me. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. Why did Jesus take on humanity? He took on humanity so he could take on mortality. He took on human flesh so that he could die as a man. There are two Gospels which have gone out over the world. There's the Gospel of the Taliban, which says we need to kill the unbeliever. And there's the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who says, we need to die for the unbeliever. The Taliban says, if you don't believe, I'm going to kill you to get you into hell as soon as possible. The Christian says, if you don't believe, I'm willing to die for you to allow you to live a little longer so that one day you may repent and join me in heaven. Now here's the question we must ask. Which gospel is from God and which gospel is from the devil? When we understand the identity of this angel, that it's not a mere angel, it's not a created being, it's the Malak Yahweh, it's the angel of the Lord, it's the pre-incarnate Christ. 
What the angel is really saying is, you don't have to kill your son because I'm willing for my father to sacrifice me. My father is willing to sacrifice his son so that you don't have to sacrifice your son. That's what's happening in Genesis 22. Do not stretch out your hand, verse 12, against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. His only son who's an heir, his only son through the wife of his youth, his beloved Sarah. Verse 13 says that then Abraham raised his eyes and look, and behold, behind him a ram an animal caught by his horns in the thick underbrush. What was he caught by? He was caught by a crown of thorns. And so the ram was taken and sacrificed instead of Isaac. We have this word for pattern or picture. It's a little bit of a theological word. It's called type, typos in Greek. It just means a picture, something to remind us. It's the shadow before the substance. Isaac is a type of Christ because he's the long-expected son through whom the blessing will come. But the ram is also a type of Christ because he is the substitute. He dies instead of Isaac. So, in my opinion, there's no higher place in the Old Testament than Genesis 22. Abraham called the name of that place, verse 14, Yehovah Yireh, Yahweh Yireh, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord. You see, God can swear by nothing higher than Himself because there is nothing higher than Himself. In America, when a person sits down to comes into a courtroom as a witness, he's asked to, to raise his right hand and put his left hand on the Bible. No, to, yeah, and to swear an oath on the Bible that he will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Why is he asked to put his hand on the Bible? It's interesting because America is a secular country, but they still use the Bible in a courtroom. Well, the idea is that the Bible is higher than you, so you're swearing on something higher than yourself, that you're telling the truth. Well, God cannot appeal to any standard or any authority higher than Himself. So it says in verse 16, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven, as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice." Now, you know, God has been giving Abraham these promises for 40 years. and. He gave him those promises before Abraham ever did anything this great. And now he tells him one last time, it's because you did these great things that I'm going to do it. Well, wh why is he going to do it? Is he going to do it because he said he was going to do it and because he, he promised he was going to do it? Or is he going to do it because Abraham passed the test and, and earned it? Well, it's the first, not the second. But. 
God does not fulfill His promises because of our obedience, but God does fulfill His promises through our obedience. And Calvin said it like this, God does not fulfill His promises without our obedience. So, so our obedience is not the cause of the fulfillment but our obedience is the instrument of the fulfillment. The fact, it's not that we, we deserve to have these promises fulfilled. It's because of God's grace. But those who believe the promises of God given to them as undeserving sinners grow in their merit, grow in their desert, in their deservingness. It's by believing the promises of God that we grow and mature and come to a place where we, if, if we're not deserving, we are more deserving of the fulfillment of the promises of God. And that's what happened in Abraham's life.